Today's episode is all about getting started ice fishing, the gear you need, how to be safe, and what you need to know to start pulling fish through the ice. All that and more on this episode of Tackle Talk. Hello everybody, I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. Welcome to the Tackle Talk Podcast, sponsored by TopFishingDeals.com. Updated daily to provide you with savings on all your favorite gear. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Tackle Talk. As always, the Tackle Talk podcast is brought to you guys by TopFishingDeals.com. One of the best places on the internet to make sure that you are not getting ripped off on your gear, that you're getting the best price, is Top Fishing Deals. I check it every single morning. It's one of those things that's become part of my game plan now. I wake up, I check it just to see what's on sale, see if there's anything new from the day before, anything that uh, you know I may need, whether I need it now or whether I need it down the road, I'd rather buy it while it's on sale, and that's what Top Fishing Deals helps me do. They're scouring the internet every single day to try and find the best sales to put them in front of you guys, the anglers, with no subscription fees, no gimmicks, no nothing. Just a simple, clean website that will show you sales. It's kind of a, a bass fisherman's best dream, I guess, could be like, you know, a website that just shows me everything that's on sale from all of the places that I would normally go to check and see if I can scour through their clearance department or, you know, that page that says special deals or whatever. I don't have to do that for 50 websites anymore. Top Fishing Deals does it for me. So go support them. Check them out www.topfishingdeals.com to make sure you're getting the best price on your gear. Don't overpay, topfishingdeals.com. All right, let's get into our episode here today. And before we get into ice fishing, before we get into all that, we do have some tournament news to cover a little bit. I want to keep you guys up to date here. Um, the Bassmaster Elite Series just finished up their event on the St. Johns River in Patalka, Florida this last week. It was February 11th through 14th, I think, um, was the dates of it. And I don't know about you guys, it just feels so good to have competitive fishing back and you know it always kind of gets me in the mood for spring gets me excited for kind of pre-spawn and stuff is when all of these events kind of kick off and it's just a new year um new chances to kind of break that biggest fish you've ever caught to really start over and uh, and have a good year fishing so it's just it's always fun when you get that first event and you get to kind of tune back in and watch these guys and it was a good event it really was there was a couple storylines we'll get to in a minute first off this was the first Bassmaster Elite event um, that was broadcast on Fox Sports as part of that huge deal that they brokered in this offseason where uh, Fox Sports was going to cover a lot of Bassmaster Live and I think I think it's the last two days of most of the events they're covered on Fox Sports and that's a big deal for competitive fishing and I think that's a direct result of COVID if I'm going to be honest and this past year when there wasn't really a whole lot of of competitive sports on, you know, you had baseball shut down, you had basketball shut down, you had, uh, you know, football have its issues, and that was kind of its off season anyway. Um, in the summer last year, basically all sports kind of went by the wayside, but Bassmaster and MLF and stuff kind of found ways to keep powering through. I know there was kind of a, a brief shutdown a little bit when everything was shut down and we didn't really know what was going on, but they powered through, they got their events back up and running, and I'm sure that brought a lot of new fans to the sport. I mean, when your two options are watching like, Saudi Arabian cricket at 2 a.m. or uh, the Bassmaster Elite Series, you know, you're going to tune in, you're going to watch competitive fishing, even if you don't like fishing at all. It's just, it's a sport to watch. So it really brought a lot of fans. I'm sure it did. I'm sure you can look up ratings and stuff, and it had to have improved. And I'm sure that's the reason why this this deal with Fox Sports happened was because they realized like, hey, you guys did pretty well last year when there wasn't anything else going on and people really enjoyed it. Let's get behind this thing and let's make it a thing and let's give you some more coverage. So this was the first event on Fox Sports and uh, when you're watching these events, like if you watch Bassmaster Live in general, the kind of in-house production that they do of this stuff, there's going to be issues with filming a live fishing tournament. Uh, it It's just, it's the nature of it, right? It's bad cell reception. You're in the middle of these lakes. You have so many cameras and, you know, people trying to live broadcast back to a studio that then hits your TV. There's going to be technical uh, issues and feedback and stuff. And uh, they, they definitely saw that. I, I think it was kept to a minimum, which was nice. Um, but that being said, the rest of it was fantastic. Um, visuals look great. The commentary was great with Zona and Davey and, you know, Mercer and everybody. They all did a great job. Um, so for the event itself, there were a couple storylines. The first one was fog. 
Um, you had the very first day of the first event of the season get delayed because of fog, which was a bummer. You tune in, you're ready for it, you're all excited to kick it off, and then there's like a couple hour fog delay. And You know, that might not seem like a big deal to a lot of you guys listening because you're like, oh, everybody's in the same boat, right? You lost a couple hours. Everybody goes out and they're handicapped by that same, you know, couple hours lost and it's an even playing field. But the thing you have to remember is like some of these guys had plans in place from the days of practice that maybe there was a pattern that they were on in the morning that they weren't on in the afternoon. It affected some people. You could definitely tell it did too. You could see some of these guys that it affected some worse than others because of their game plan and how they were going to attack the day when you kind of have to scrap your early morning bite that you had figured out so maybe that was top water you know maybe that was something uh to do that only you had like this small window in the morning to cover they lost that some other guys that maybe had some other patterns that worked well in the afternoon or something uh it played to their favor for sure so it definitely affected some folks worse than others but the fog was an issue especially day one Um, The second storyline and the big one from this is that Brian New won the event. He is a rookie out of North Carolina. He took home his first blue trophy in his very first Elite Series event. That is a great way to start off your career. He had an okay start on day one. I think he was in like 22nd or 23rd place after day one, but he kind of slowly crept up. I know uh, on day two, he was in 10th. Day three, I think he made it up to like fifth or sixth, and then he dropped a mega sack on day four, the final day. He dropped, I think it was 26 pounds, four ounces to take the win on day four. So Mr. New, one for one on his Elite Series resume there, not too shabby. The next stop for the Elite guys is the Tennessee River on February 25th through 28th. And then we also had Major League Fishing kick off. I am recording this on Monday night before it goes live on Tuesday. So today was the first day of Red Crest for the Major League Fishing Bass Pro Tour. So they kicked that off today. The last I saw, I think Brian Thrift was hammering him. I'm pretty sure he had like 45 pounds. And then I know the top 10 had like Ott Defoe was in there. Uh, Andy Morgan, I saw KVD. Uh, Mark Davis, I think Andy Montgomery. Um, Takahiro Mori. There, there were a bunch of guys in the top 10 that... You know, obviously our household names, I think, you know, the whole field of of Major League Fishing is household names, really. But, you know, some some guys that you guys will recognize in that top 10. Uh, And we will pick up next week and probably bring you the results of that once this event kind of clears its way. I know they did have some issues with this one, too. Obviously, it was supposed to be on, I think it was Lake Palestine in Texas with the freeze and everything that happened. They delayed it, and then they had to move it to Eufaula. So, you know, just kind of a headache for them. I'm sure nobody really plans for, like, a -a once-in-a-lifetime winter weather kind of freeze down in Texas to kick off your year. But I think they did okay with it with the hand they were dealt. They got it rescheduled. It seems to be going pretty well, and we're excited to see how Red Crest finishes up later this week. All right, we are going to get into ice fishing in just a second. I have a lot to talk about with ice fishing, Um, but first, I want to give you guys a quick message from Dark Horse Tackle. Dark Horse Tackle, as you guys know, an awesome monthly subscription service that delivers high-quality, small-batch, custom baits right to your door each and every month. So you don't have to go seeking these, you know, companies out on the internet. You don't have to do all this research. Dark Horse Tackle is going to give you a box that is curated with some really cool kind of custom lures, you know, custom painted crankbaits, custom made jigs, uh, really cool stuff in there from these small lure makers that are making high quality stuff. So if you are like me, if you love tackle, if you love trying new stuff and finding new companies to support, I would really encourage you to check out a Dark Horse Tackle subscription. I have had a subscription to most boxes at this point. And the few boxes that I've got from Dark Horse Tackle, I have loved more than any other box that I got from anywhere else. So go over, check out www.darkhorsetackle.com, click subscribe, you'll see the different options there. If you use code TACKLETALK30, TACKLETALK30 at checkout, you will get 30% off your first month's box just for listening to the show. Go support them, great guys that are running that over there, www.darkhorsetackle.com. All right, we are going to get into a topic that I have not touched on on this whole program since we've had it for like the two years that we've been running Tackle Talk, and for good reason, and that's ice fishing. And the reason I haven't talked about ice fishing at all, you can probably go back and hear me mention it in a couple episodes, it's because I've never been ice fishing. Uh, Now, some of you know, like, hey, I live in Ohio, that seems far enough north that I should have a lot of ice around here, and ice fishing should kind of be in our blood. Um, It's not really the case. I live in southern Ohio, where we're kind of in that middle ground, where it's cold enough to be miserable, and it's cold enough to have snow on the ground and to make fishing just awful, but it's not cold enough to have safe ice a lot of places. You know, there's a few places I'll get to in a second that we have been able to find safe ice, and there are some lakes that are kind of known for it around here, but for the most part, like, 
all of our ponds and stuff, very, very rarely are you going to get ice that is good enough to go out and walk on. So again, just kind of in that middle ground of no man's land of like, you know, you can't win around here, right? It's cold. The open water fishing sucks if you can find it. The ice that is on, you know, your ponds or your lakes or whatever, a lot of times is too thin to walk out on, let alone drill and fish. So you're just kind of miserable in the wintertime. But this winter, um, if you go back and you listen to our New Year's resolution episode, which is one of my favorite episodes we do all year, um, one of the things that, you know, I kind of recommend on there is is trying a new style of fishing, and I'm not any different than you guys. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to try new styles of fishing. I am going to abide by those kind of resolutions that I tried to set for myself and for you guys, too. So I wanted to try a new style of fishing, and that this year is ice fishing. And ice fishing, to me, never seemed appealing. There's just something about, like, sitting on ice while it's freezing cold out and vertical jigging for panfish that, you know, I really thought like that sounds more miserable than going out and trying to fish my open water that we have that is awful conditions and these fish aren't cooperating. I would rather do that in open water than go, you know, kind of uh, jig for bluegill or something. That's kind of how I looked at ice fishing and I, I, I just didn't see the appeal in it. And boy, was I wrong. And I'm honest enough to admit when I'm wrong about something I was wrong. That was maybe one of the biggest mistakes I'd ever made when it comes to fishing is not getting into ice fishing sooner. I really dropped the ball there because holy moly, is it fun. So today we're going to go over kind of how to get started in ice fishing and what you need to know because truthfully over the past like four or five weeks, I have went through all this. I went from never ice fishing at all to now being confident enough that I think I could go out on my own and do it just fine and maybe you know, help other people get into it for the first time. I'm definitely not uh, a savvy at this by any means, but I feel like I know enough to get by now. And that's obviously a big thanks to my friends that took me out and were helpful and patient with me as I learned and got the hang of it. You know, uh, Ryan, Tyler, Nate, everybody that kind of went out with me my first couple times and showed me the ropes. I, I definitely appreciate it because again, it was one of those things, if I went out blind and I tried to do it myself, I probably could have figured it out, but there would have been a big learning curve and it would have taken me a lot longer. So thanks to those guys for kind of sticking with me and uh, helping me along this journey a little bit and get me started in ice fishing. But I just want to share this with you guys. If you're like me, if you would have asked me two months ago, how do you ice fish? I don't know, man. I know you use small rods, you drill a hole and you just kind of bounce Uh, your rod up and down until you reel in a bluegill. That's really all I knew. And there's a lot more to it than that. Obviously, there's a lot of gear. There's a lot of tactics, things like that, that we're going to cover here. And we're just going to basically do like an ice fishing 101, how to get started. So, you know, if you've never went out ice fishing before and it just seems like a daunting task to try, um, but maybe you do have safe ice around you or you have ice within driving distance that you want to give it a shot, this will get you started and will let you go out with a little bit of confidence. Um, Safely, obviously, is the big thing here and uh, and kind of know what you're doing a little bit. So first off, let's cover the gear that you're going to need besides rods, reels, lures, fishing gear, stuff like that. I'm talking about gear that maybe you don't think about, but you need uh, to go ice fishing. And there's a lot of it. I'm going to be honest. I thought it was just like, you know, you need something to drill a hole and you need a little rod and that's not it at all. So the very first thing you need are ice picks. And this is going to be like a theme here. Safety first, Ice picks are a must, and ice picks are these things that kind of go around your neck, and they're either kind of retractable or they pop open, and they're just exactly what they sound like. They're really sharp things where if you fall through the water, like if you step on a weak spot, you fall right through, the worst thing that's going to happen is like you can't grab on to anything. You can't reach your hands out and grab on this ice uh, or pull yourself back up because you have no no grip, right? You can't grab that ice and pull yourself up. You're just going to slide. So you need something to really be able to stop yourself from sliding any further and pull yourself out, and that's what these ice picks do. So keep them around your neck. If you do fall through, you just open them up, and you basically stab the ice around you, and it keeps you from going through the rest of the way, and then you can pull yourself out. So really life-saving piece of equipment that costs like eight bucks and uh, will give you some peace of mind too. So have your ice picks with you. Number two, you're going to need warm, dry clothes, and both of those are important, not just warm, not just dry, both of them. And for me, that usually means like a ton of layers. I had somebody message me today uh, about what to take when you're going on like, you know, your first really cold, uh, I think he was going canoeing, but you know, what do you do to to stay warm and to kind of be prepared? Warm and dry are the two names of the game there. So what I usually do is I have base layers on. I look like the Michelin man, probably. I got, you know, uh, a base layer. I've got a long sleeve shirt, another long sleeve shirt, a sweatshirt, 
um, kind of like a fleece jacket, and then my winter coat, right? That's what it looks like on top. On the bottom, got like long johns, then you got, uh, I usually put like a skinny pair of jeans on so that I can fit those under my waders, and I actually wear my insulated waders out ice fishing. They're one of the warmest things I own. They're waterproof, and that's the big thing here too. You know, you want like that that seam between your foot and your pants to be waterproof. You want everything because you're going to be stepping around and ice and slush and snow sometimes and stuff so you really got to be dry this whole time the worst thing that can happen is you get wet somehow whether it's you know it gets your socks get wet or your legs or whatever and then you're just going to be miserable the rest the rest of the day that's when you really get into that you know worrying about frostbite and hypothermia and stuff a lot of times is when you mix like cold with wet so you don't want either of those so warm dry clothes are a must layer up uh, if you have a pair of insulated waders those work great a lot of people have bibs and you know big kind of ice suits and stuff do whatever you need to do but stay warm and stay dry the next thing that you need is something that i didn't even think about when we went ice fishing for the first time and that's a pair of cleats so you don't need like your own special uh shoes to wear you really need something that will go on the outside of whatever boots or shoes that you're wearing to kind of grip the ice so you want like you know, like spikes on the bottom of your shoes so you don't slide around on the ice. And it's amazing how well they work, just a cheap pair of spikes. So um, what I did is I went on Amazon, I searched ice fishing cleats. They had a bunch of different ones pop up. They're just little rubber things that you slip on the outside of your boot and that they have uh, spikes on the bottom, almost like like golf shoes or uh, like track spikes or something, if you ever ran track, uh, something like that. So um, that's what you need. Uh, Again, like eight bucks on Amazon, I think is what I paid for mine. They work fine, nothing expensive, but will be a lifesaver out there so you're not sliding around. Um, Next, you're obviously gonna need a bucket, like one to carry all of your stuff in and two to sit on. If you look out while, you know, people are ice fishing, 90% of people are sitting on buckets. You know, get a five gallon bucket from Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart or something. That's what I did, I think it was like three bucks. And just a lifesaver. You got a seat. You have a seat that also doubles as something that can carry all of your junk. So you need a five-gallon bucket. Um, You need waterproof gloves. That's something that I'm really glad I had the first time that I didn't really think about. I just went to Walmart and was like, I need a pair of gloves to go ice fishing tomorrow. And I bought like a $9 pair of gloves that that seemed warm enough. And turns out they're waterproof. So that's a big thing too. You know, you're going to be gripping fish. You're going to be... Um, you know, in situations where your gloves are going to touch things that are wet, whether it's, you know, the water, whether it's the ice, whether it's fish, whatever it is, you want waterproof gloves because otherwise your gloves are just going to get wet and then they're serving like the opposite purpose of what they need to do. So you can't go out with like wool mittens or anything, right? You're going to want waterproof gloves. Um, you're also going to need an auger. That seems like a duh thing, but you really do. Um, you need something to drill holes. You can either get a hand crank auger that are like 50 bucks, um, or you can get like an attachment for a drill. That's what my buddy Ryan did. Uh, I think it's a little bit more expensive, but holy cows, it worked great. You can pop holes for days with that thing. Um, they also make, you know, I think it's gas or electric augers too if you really want to spend the money if you're going to be doing this a lot but bottom line you need something to drill a hole and there's different size holes that you probably want to look at i think there's like six inch augers eight inch augers ten inch augers um i think we were using six and it works just fine you know i probably wouldn't use anything smaller than that if you're going to be fishing for a decent size fish but you know like a six inch hole is perfectly fine um you also need a scooper so you're going to drill this hole and there's going to be ice and slush at the top of the hole and if you're trying to drop like you know your small little jig or something down it's going to get in the way you need a scooper, something to just scoop out the the slush and the ice from the top after you drill the hole uh, is a lifesaver. So get you a scooper, again, five, ten bucks, it's all you need. Um, bring a tape measure or a measuring board, this is optional, so the next couple are going to be optional. Um, so I guess the things that you need besides the fishing gear are ice picks, warm clothes, uh, cleats, a bucket, waterproof gloves, an auger, and a scooper. So those are kind of musts. Now here are your optional things if you really want to kind of do it upright. Um, the first is a tape measure or a measuring board. If you're going to be fishing for panfish and you're going to keep them, know your regulations, know what your smallest size you can keep is, and have a measuring board with you. Don't eyeball it because out there on the water, you know, on the ice especially, there are wardens walking around. There are people checking fish. So make sure that you have something to, to double check to make sure your fish is as long as it needs to be to keep. Um, also a spud bar. And I put this optional because a lot of people will fish in places where there's so many people and it's so obvious that the ice is safe that you may not need a spud bar. Um, but if you are going out on your own or you're going out on a body of water that there aren't people ice fishing and you want to make sure it's safe, you need a spud bar. You just need some big, long metal bar to kind of stab the, the ice in front of you to make sure it's safe to walk on. So a spud bar is a must if you're going out on kind of <laughs> uh, less familiar water 
or uh, uncharted water. You know, not a lot of people out there ice fishing where we went. There's shanties and stuff everywhere. You can obviously tell that it's safe. There's paths to where people are fishing, so you don't really need a spud bar. Um, but if you're going out on a pond or something by yourself or with a buddy, not a place that's highly trafficked where you know that it's safe, you need a spud bar. Um, next optional thing is a shanty. Uh, some sort of shelter is definitely a plus. You don't need it, but man, when that wind starts howling out there on an open lake or something, you're going to wish that you had one probably. So a shanty is an awesome thing. Uh, again, a little pricey. So if you're trying to keep this to a budget, might not be uh, in your wheelhouse. I think they're like a couple hundred bucks for some nice ones. Um, but again, some sort of mobile uh, portable shelter is definitely nice to have. Um, the next one's a sled, and I really underestimated how important a sled was going to be to carrying all of your stuff, but we were going out with like two or three people, and instead of having to lug that heavy, you know, bucket with all of your stuff in it, your electronics and your gear and everything, just get a sled. They're like 40 or 50 bucks for like a nice ice sled, and you can pull like hundreds of pounds of stuff with like little to no effort at all. So sleds are great. And also, the, uh, the last thing I guess that's optional would be a heater. So if you're going to be in a shanty or something, and you want to have a little portable heater, that can be a lifesaver too, especially depending on what your temperatures are. Um, ours around here, when we were going out in the morning, were like, I think the wind chills were like negative five or so. So again, not warm by any means, but not cold enough that you couldn't get by until the sun came up, until you know you got into the five or 10 degree wind chill, or you know 15 degree wind chill where it wasn't that bad. But if you're up way north, like you're going to want a shanty, you're going to want a heater, you're going to want something to keep you warm so the optional things on there uh tape measure measuring board uh spud bar we had a shanty on there a sled and a heater okay so now let's get to the actual fishing gear that you need to go out and ice fish and the first thing is obviously rods and this was a tough one for me because i'm coming from you know the bass world like dumb open water bass guy here i had no idea what like rod lengths powers all that kind of stuff really meant when it come to ice fishing stuff i just knew that like used a short rod and when i saw that there was like ultra light light medium light medium medium heavy all that kind of stuff you know i'm thinking of open water bass so i'm thinking like okay you know medium heavy is probably your normal stick and then you go down from there not the case at all so the rods that you're going to find oftentimes in stores and stuff, you're going to find ultralight, light, and medium light are going to be kind of your go-to panfish rods. There are mediums and medium heavies out there. I think those are more for like pike or walleye, stuff like that. So if you are really going after like lake trout or something crazy, something big, then yeah, maybe you need those mediums or medium heavies. Um, but really what we were doing for, you know, the saw guy, the walleye, the perch, the big crappies, stuff like that, an ultralight light and medium light is really the only spectrum that you're going to need. So um, I want to break down at least uh, what I found useful for these types of rods, starting with the ultralight. The ultralight is going to be your go-to panfish jig rod. Um, when I saw ultralight, I was like, oh, I don't need anything that light, right? Like I'm not, uh, I'm not using an ultralight. I want something that's got enough backbone to do this. No, ice fishing is totally different. Backbone is not as big of deal when you're dealing with these small panfish and, you know, walleyes or saw guys or whatever. It's really more about how effectively you can work your bait and not about what happens when the fish is on. So I know that sounds like a weird thing for us like open water bass folks to think about, but really it is working your lure. And once that fish is on, you know, you've got light line, you've got your drag set, all kinds of stuff. It can double over that rod if it wants. It doesn't really matter, right? As long as it's hooked okay, you can play it up to the hole. So it really becomes how can you effectively work whatever lure you're throwing? So with the ultralights, that's for panfish jigs. That's for those small tungsten itty bitty jigs with the tiny plastics on them that you're used to seeing or the you know spikes or wax worms or whatever um, those kind of things that are kind of synonymous with jigging to me over the past few months when I think of like a jigging rod I think of my ultralight rod that's really what that's become for me uh, the light rod that was something I was using more for like small Swedish pimples small spoons very small blade baits uh, I bought like a 1 16th ounce cicada a uh, little blade bait that I was ripping up with that thing. So the light is really for kind of your middle of the road stuff for small uh, lures that aren't uh, small tungstens, I guess. Or I guess if you're bumping up your size of your tungsten, you can probably use a light. Uh, again, I'm not an expert on this by any means. I just learned like a couple weeks ago. But what I was using that for, again, small Swedish pimples, small spoons, anything that you're kind of vertical jigging but not really ripping hard. 
uh, is what I was using that light rod for. And then a medium light rod, that kind of found its home with Vibes or, you know, kind of medium sized blade baits, uh, slightly larger spoons, anything that I'm ripping off the bottom a little harder for like those saw guy or the walleye is what I was using that medium light for. Again, just something that can handle a little thin fisher or, you know, a little uh, Vibe or something like that. That medium light came in pretty clutch for that kind of stuff. So, Ultralight, light, and medium light is really what you need for kind of your normal game fish for uh, ice fishing. And then if you are going out on like Lake Erie or something like that and you're going after bigger fish, maybe those mediums or medium heavies come into play. Uh, So now what reel do you pair with that rod, right? You've got this tiny little ice rod. What do you put on it reel-wise? For most of them, I'd say for like the light and the medium light, I would go with like a cheap 500 size spinning reel. Just nothing fancy like, you know, a little Shimano Sienna or some little $20, $30 reel is going to do just fine, especially for the small panfish. Um, You don't really need anything crazy. Uh, And I would put those on your medium light and your light rod. The only thing I would say is they do make ice fishing reels that look Uh, I guess if I had to describe it more like a fly fishing reel, you know, just kind of a circle in there with a little crank on the side. Um, Those came in really handy for my ultralight setup where you're dropping down some small, small jig. It just seemed to let that that jig fall a little bit more cleanly, a little bit more naturally because that's kind of what those those reels are made for, I guess, is like letting very small, lightweight things fall. If you're going to use a spinning reel, right, that, that line has to come off in circles and it's just kind of weird, especially when there's not enough uh, weight, I guess, from your, your jig to really pull on that line. So I think in that instance, I might go with like more of a traditional ice fishing reel for the ultralight if you're going to use that for kind of small tungstens. But other than that, you know, for the the light and the medium light, 500 size spinning reel seem to do just fine. Um, And then as far as line goes, I know there's a billion options out there. I went with straight four pound copolymer. That's what I used on every single one of my setups, my ultralight, my light and my medium light, four pound copolymer. Um, again, a, a line that I wouldn't use for anything, uh, in the open water bass world, right? I hate copolymers. Um, I don't think they really serve much of a purpose there, um, except that they're cheap. That's really like the only thing that they really have going for them. Um, and that's, that's kind of the reason why I gravitated toward it for ice fishing, if I'm going to be honest. It's like, I have to spool up three reels here. Um, I don't need anything crazy, right? You're fishing for bluegill and crappie and uh, saw guy and stuff like that. It's like, I don't need uh, any crazy line. So I went with regular P-Line Floor Clear. And I know they have like um, Fluoro Ice, I think, is an option. I think P-Line makes it um, for ice fishing. I heard, I don't know if this is true or not, um, take this with a grain of salt, but I heard from multiple people, including one that was fairly reputable, that P-Line Fluoro Ice and P-Line Fluoro Clear are the same line, just in different spools. So basically, the joke he said was like, I was like, what's the difference between uh, Flora Clear and Flora Ice? And the answer that I found was basically that uh, Floro Ice is in a smaller package and it's a slightly different color. Like, that's the only thing. It's the same line as what I was told. And again, don't know if that's true or not, um, but that's what I heard, so I'm passing along to you guys. Basically, what I found is that the regular Flora Clear worked just fine. Uh, it comes in a big spool, so I was able to spool up all three of my reels perfectly fine. It's like eight bucks for the whole spool, and it did what it needed to do. So I went with four pound copolymer. I know you can use mono, you can use fluoro. Uh, they make ice fishing braids, all that kind of stuff. The copoly did it fine for me, right? It's it's small, it's thin, uh, it does the job. You're not you don't need anything crazy for this. So four pound copolymer is what I used for all my setups. And now let's get to lures. So if I were going to make a small tackle box full of kind of ice fishing lures that I would I would take for the first time which I did I did this a couple weeks ago actually I had to make my very first ice fishing box and I had to buy my lures for the first time so this is kind of uh, what I added to that box the first thing was blade baits I knew that blade baits worked Um, I know that you know if you're jigging those in a hole you can hole hop and you can just kind of you know rip them off the bottom and you can catch walleyes or saw guys or whatever you got around you you can catch panfish that way too so I knew I wanted blade baits so I did get some really small vibes I got some really small again there was like a cicada um, the little uh, mean eyes from Cabela's work fine um, little thin fishers anything that's a blade bait that you can rip up and down will work fine so I got some small ones of those Um, I got some small spoons, so again, like a Swedish pimple or something that you can just kind of vertical jig that will fall and kind of flutter. I wanted something like that too, so I got a couple of those. Um, I bought a couple jigging wraps, which I know is an ice fishing staple. I haven't caught many fish on them, but I'm just going with conventional wisdom here that I think probably having a small jigging wrap or two in your box is a good idea. 
Um, and then you get to more of the jigging stuff. So the two things that I did best on um, obviously go together, but the first one is the small ice fishing plastics. So, you know, like a, a half inch to an inch ice fishing plastics, I'm talking small, I'm talking about like the smaller the better was key for us. So little things that you look at, you think, how does a fish even see that? in, you know, <laughs> with the water that I'm fishing, how is this going to get found? Trust me, it does. Uh, there's just something about those tiny, tiny baits that get any fish to commit to them. So, you know, really, really, really micro twister tails, um, the little single tail baits, the double tails. I mean, seriously, these things look like absolutely nothing, but they're the ticket. I mean, we caught so many fish and so many big fish on lures that are like the size of the white part of your fingernail. Like, it, it, they're so tiny, but they work. Um, so then obviously you're going to pair those small plastics with tungsten jigs. And first off, the sizing when I was trying to buy tungsten jigs for the first time was a nightmare. I, I don't know how any of this stuff works. When you're looking at ice fishing jigs and you look at them, you're like, oh, these ice fishing jigs are three millimeters or four millimeters, five, six millimeters. You're looking at it, you're like, that means nothing to me. I have no idea what that means. They all look the same. They all look small. Uh, I don't know if I need a six millimeter or a three millimeter. I know looking at them with my eyeballs, they don't look much different, but that is, you know, two, three, four sizes away from each other, so I know there has to be a big difference. So what is the sizing in, like, you know, uh, metrics that I can understand as, again, a normal bass fisherman? So basically, I looked it up. It sounds like a three millimeter tungsten jig is 172nd ounce, so very, very small, and uses a number 16 hook. And then if you go up from there, a four millimeter is a 136 ounce and uses a number 14 hook. A five millimeter is a 118th ounce and uses a number 12 hook. And then a six millimeter is your 110th ounce and it uses a number 10 hook and it, et cetera. It keeps going from there. So, so basically, you know, each millimeter up, you are going. Uh, two numbers down on the hook, so you're going like the smallest was a number 16, then a number 14, a number 12, a number 10, and you're going from 132nd to 116th to 18th to 110th ounce. So you're almost cutting it in half every time. So uh, that's how the jigs are really broken down in terms of sizing. And with that in mind, we were using a lot of four millimeters. So you know, kind of right there, middle of the pack, 136th ounce. Uh, number 14 hooks seem to do just fine. And we were catching, I mean, crappie, gills, bass, saw guy, perch, uh, white bass, you name it, we were catching it. So that really small hook seemed to do well for basically, I feel confident saying like almost any species uh, was able to be effectively fished with a four millimeter size jig. So that was nice. Um, the other issue that I had when I was looking up tungsten jigs was that I'm a cheapskate. Like you guys know me. And when I looked up the price of these things, my mouth hit the floor. Like it was, again, these small microscopic lures. And they are like three to six dollars each. And if you look at someone's like tungsten box, usually they got like 30, 40, 50 different little jigs in there, sometimes even more. So I'm looking at that and I'm like, holy moly, you're talking about $150 spending on your first 30 little tungsten jigs the size of a pea. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not playing that game and paying $5 per pea-sized jig. So I did some research. I found that if you go to some other websites, like I think I found uh, mine on Amazon actually, but there were some websites if you looked hard enough that you could find unpainted tungsten jigs for like 60, 70 cents each. So they weren't that expensive. Again, expensive in terms of like how small these things are, but when you weigh that with like 70 cents versus $5 per jig, I'm going to go with 70 cents. That sounded a whole lot better. So then became the thing of like, okay, I bought a 25 pack for I think like 16 bucks or whatever it was, and then I needed to decide how to paint them. And I make my own regular jigs with powder paint, so I thought maybe that would be a good start. So I went down that road quickly to find out that is not the answer. So basically, I did some research, and what it sounds like is most things that you buy that are tungsten, the tungsten part anyway, is pre-made. And that's because tungsten is so hard to melt as such a high melting point that it's very hard for like a normal person, you know, with a normal setup in their garage or whatever, you can't melt that tungsten effectively and make things. Even a lot of these other companies, like you're going to see some companies out there that make tungsten jigs or whatever. Those tungsten jigs are made overseas somewhere, not in somebody's garage most likely, and then shipped over here. They're buying them from some other source because again, it's just not practical to melt tungsten uh, for a small operation. So it really takes some heavy duty equipment that 99% of people, it sounds like just don't have the ability to do. So 
The same thing with these small tungsten jigs. It sounds like almost every company that you're going to buy a, an actual finished tungsten jig from for that $5 or whatever it was, they're buying these same blanks and basically just painting them and selling them to you. Because it sounds like the tungsten itself is a pre-made piece, and then you take a hook, and then you insert it in a little slot in the tungsten, and then you either solder or epoxy that hook into place. And that becomes your blank, and then you paint that. So I think a lot of people end up uh, airbrushing these or whatever because the issue then becomes if it's soldered in there I can't heat that jig up to dip into the powder paint to bake because what happens is when you heat that jig up you melt the solder and then the hook falls out so it's you know you can't heat it up to properly powder paint these things so then I was like okay how do you paint these because I can't be the only one that does this turns out most people use fingernail polish so I looked it up Yes, you can use fingernail polish to paint these things, um, and so I went to Dollar Tree in my camo hoodie and camo hat, and I bought like $10 worth of, you know, $1 uh, fingernail polishes, got some weird looks, but, uh, you know, I took them home, and uh, I got to work. Basically, I took these little uh, blank jigs that I bought off of Amazon, I put them in a fly vise, and I started carefully painting them with the small little brush that comes in the bottle of fingernail polish. So these $1 bottles of fingernail polish start painting these jigs. They start looking pretty good. And I'm like, okay, now I kind of see what I'm doing here. So the very first thing I learned was obviously it takes a fairly steady hand. You're dealing with a really small jig. I'm talking like aggravatingly small. So be careful, you know, put some paper or something under it. You're going to drip stuff. So just be careful there. And then number two, you're going to get paint in the eyelet of that jig. That's just going to happen. There's nothing you can really do about it, but it's very frustrating because that eyelet is so small that you can't poke like a pin or something through there because it just won't fit. The eyelet on these jigs is insanely tiny. So then what it becomes is like, how do I hollow out? I basically painted this jig, but now the hole is covered up with paint. And I don't want that to dry like that because then you're not can be able to thread your line through. So what I did was I actually took a piece of fishing line that I just kind of cut and kept on the desk. And as soon as I was done painting that jig, I took that fishing line, just poked it through that hole while the paint was still wet. And then that kind of broke that surface tension that the paint was doing. And it made that hole open up. And then you can hang that, that hook up and it will dry normally. And you'll be able to thread your line through when that dries. So keep a little piece of fishing line and poke it through. And that'll help you clear that eyelet before it dries. And then the other thing is obviously fingernail polish is somewhat durable, but it's not durable enough to be just painting, you know, fishing jigs with it. It's going to chip pretty easily. So then it became, how do I seal this off? I used epoxy. And I think that's what a lot of other people do too. I'm sure there's other things you can use. I'm sure there's like fingernail polish hardener or whatever that girls use, I think. But I just used epoxy. I have epoxy in my house anyway that I use to kind of put the weed guards in the regular jigs that I make. So I just mixed a little bit of that up. I took a tiny, tiny, tiny paintbrush that I bought from Dollar Tree too. So again, a dollar paintbrush. And I basically started just very lightly coating these tiny jigs with epoxy. And again, you're gonna have that hole get covered up, poke it through with that line, or just be really careful with the epoxy itself. You can kind of work your way around that hole and not actually seal it up. So it's up to you. Either be really careful or poke it through with that fishing line again to make sure that your hole doesn't dry with epoxy or else you're never going to be able to use these jigs. Um, so that was kind of it. So basically what happened is I, I, I would paint them. I let them dry. I might give them a second coat of paint or put some glitter paint on them or paint some eyes or something on them. Then I'd set them up to dry. I'd give them a coat of epoxy. I let them dry for a day and voila, you have these jigs that I'm not kidding. You can look at the jigs that I have and you can look at the jigs that my friends bought online and you cannot tell the difference. They are almost identical and it's very hard to mess up something you know that small unless you're really trying to be intricate with your paint jobs which I really wasn't I did solid colors mostly with a little bit of sparkle in them or whatever painted some eyes and called it a day it's really all you need so uh, instead of paying like $150 for my first box of tungstens and getting started I paid like 25 which is a win in my book so my advice would be if you don't want to drop that much crazy money on tungsten jigs paint your own Okay, and finally, let's get into the last piece of equipment that you're going to want, and it's some sort of electronics. And uh, I went out the first time without electronics, and it was still fun, don't get me wrong, but it is a totally different ball game if you have a flasher of some sort or you have a Vexlar or something that you can put in the hole, that you can use that flasher, that circular thing that, if I was going to be honest, I was looking at for the first time. I had no idea what I was looking at. I couldn't read it. didn't look like a normal depth finder. I was like, what is this? witchcraft contraption and how do I read this and know that one of these billion flashing marks is a fish and how do I how do I play this game basically um it is a game changer get yourself some sort of electronics it doesn't have to be anything crazy again vexlars are like 
three or four hundred bucks if you want a nice one, but you can kind of get away with jerry rigging something and and getting away with a lot less than that. I actually took the Garmin Striker Four off my kayak and I use that as my ice fishing sonar now. So, you know, most of these uh, small little units like, you know, your Garmin's or your Lawrence's or whatever will have an option on them that'll say flasher. And that's what that's for. It's really an ice fishing uh, kind of setup there is what most people use a flasher for um, or vertical jigging you can do too if you're doing an open water. But most part, uh, ice fishing, you want a flasher. So you want that circular thing. My Garmin Striker 4 has it. Uh, I saw a guy on the lake the other day that had a little, you know, cheap Lowrance hook it had one on it. All you need is something that has a flasher setting. So I literally took the unit off of my kayak. I just unplugged the two cables on the back. Everything else is left the same. So when I go to put it back on my kayak, all I have to do is just snap it back into place, plug the two things in the back, and I'm good to go. So I didn't really ruin anything. Um, I didn't cause myself a lot of headache if I want to go back and forth from kayak to ice fishing, ice fishing to kayak. But I wanted to use the main part, that that uh, screen, I guess, from my striker because that's like a $99 unit, and I don't want to buy that again if I don't have to. So it just snaps off. So I used that. I bought another mount off of Amazon for like $8, another Garmin mount, just a little thing that keeps it propped up and will tilt it. Um, And then I bought a $9 waterproof kind of military grade case off of Amazon too, just a little kind of suitcase looking thing that came with some foam inside that you could cut um, to whatever you wanted. And that's what I used to kind of set up my uh, knockoff Vexlar, I guess. So inside the case, I put a $19 marine battery um, and my cords, and then I just drilled a hole in the case to run my cords up through to my fish finder. And then I drilled the hole big enough that I could put a little plug in. So when I'm done and I close this case up, I take my fish finder off, put the fish finder in the case, put everything in the case, snap it up, and then there's a little plug that I just put in that hole so it keeps everything waterproof. Pretty slick setup. And the only other thing I really had to buy was an ice transducer. You do need an ice transducer, not the transducer that came with the Garmin um, or your Lowrance or whatever. You need a, a specialty ice transducer, which I think was like 60 bucks. So all in all, I think I spent like, I don't know, 80 ish dollars probably if I go back and actually count into making my own uh sonar setup for ice fishing versus paying 299 or 399 for a Vexlar. So saved a ton of money there. It works just fine. So if you have a fish finder laying around, use the one you got. Don't go out and spend three, four, five hundred dollars on something that you really don't need if you have most of the stuff already. Um, Okay, so that's all the gear that you need, and now let's get into kind of how to go out and ice fish, and I won't spend a ton of time on this because, again, I don't know a lot about it. I've been out like four times now, so uh, I know enough to get by to get you guys started, but that's really about it. So the first thing, safety first. I'm going to say this again. Do everything you can to do this safely because I would say this is probably the most dangerous kind of fishing that you can do. Um, The elements are not in your favor most of the time, right? Humans were not made to walk on frozen water and drill holes into it and test their luck and fish. So, you know, this is one of those things where just because you see other people do it and do it safely does not mean every time that you go out is going to be safe. So do everything you can to be safe. First off, Go with a friend. Do not go by yourself. That is a recipe for disaster. If something happens, you fall through, you step on a bad spot, you hurt yourself, you get sick, you do whatever, you don't have anybody out there to help you, right? You're relying on, if you're at a crowded lake, maybe strangers that are far away from you being able to get to you in time, go with a buddy. The buddy system works for just about everything in life and fishing is no different. Have a friend to go with you. Um, The next thing is check the ice with a spud bar or know the ice before you go out on it. Make sure that it's safe ice. You're going to hear that word a lot of times, safe ice. And safe ice means, I think general terms, people usually say four inches of good clear ice is safe to walk on and, you know, fish through and stuff. Ideally, you want more than that, but I think four inches is kind of the magic number, at least in conventional wisdom of what I've heard. Can you go out on less than that? Yes, you certainly can. Um, Is it advisable, and do I feel comfortable telling people to do that? No. So go with with the four-inch rule for good, safe ice. Um, But just, again, make sure that you're testing it um, or you're going to a place where, you know, there's 100 people out on the water and you know that it's safe over there and there's a path and everything and, you know, everybody's going the same way. You're probably good. But again, go with a friend, have your ice picks ready, have your safety gear ready just in case something bad happens. Okay, so now you're out there safely. You're on the lake. You're drilling holes with your auger and you're ready to fish. Um, Again, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because I'm still learning, but when it comes to... Uh, using your electronics and kind of playing this this game 
of figuring out what you're doing with this flasher. I went through this from not knowing at all what a flasher meant or what it looked like or how to read it to feeling like I know pretty well what I'm doing now. Um, The first thing that you're going to have to realize is that you're going to see a bunch of flashing lines on this circle, right? At some point, you're going to see those flashing lines kind of make a solid line. And then for the rest of, you know, probably, I don't know, from like nine o'clock to 12 o'clock on the screen there, is going to be like a bunch of weird noise and uh, solid lines and stuff. That's probably the bottom. So what you're going to see is you're going to see some open area between probably 12 o'clock and depending on what model you have, like, you know, 6 o'clock or 9 o'clock or whatever um, on this kind of clock face of the flasher um, that you're going to see, and it's going to be, that's going to be your water column. So what you're going to do is you're going to drop your jig or your lure down or something, and you're going to see this this line basically uh, fall from 12 o'clock down to wherever the bottom is reading on that flasher. So anywhere in between there is fair game. That's your water column. That's where you're really trying to see what's going on. You're seeing your jig, you're seeing fish, and you're trying to play this this game of getting fish to bite. So name of the game really seems to be to jig your jig toward the bottom. You know, you're kind of bouncing it off the bottom. You'll see it go up and down and kind of bounce off or wherever else in the water column that you're marking fish, you know, you're seeing other dots in between what would be the top and the bottom once you learn how to read this thing. Um, If you're seeing marks anywhere else, those could be fish. So you might want to pop up to them. Maybe they're suspended. Maybe they're crappie or whatever. Yes, bump up to them. But for the most part, what we were kind of doing is bouncing that jig somewhere near the bottom. And again, we're in shallow water. We're in like five, six foot of water a lot of times. Um, But you're bouncing that jig off the bottom, and eventually what what will happen, which is really cool, and this is the addicting part of it, the bottom, when you're looking at where the bottom is, you're going to see that that mark get stronger and stronger, and then slowly the bottom is going to kind of separate, and you're going to see this mark come from the bottom and almost like get really, really dark and split. And this one mark is going to slowly be going toward your mark that's your jig. And what you do is when you see that happen, that's a fish coming to check you out. So you very carefully jig this jig and you slowly rise that jig, raise it up, you know, uh, a couple inches or whatever, and see if that mark below you will follow suit. So if your little jig mark is going up and there's another mark coming up behind it, that is a, a fish basically kind of following you up and it's what's called raising the fish. So you're raising this fish up from the bottom and that's usually when you're going to kind of trigger strike. So you're going to see eventually that fish mark and your jig become one. And when that fish mark comes up and meets your jig, jig as you're kind of slowly lifting this up usually that's when you're going to feel a bite or you're going to see the bite on the tip of your rod or whatever it is and that's when you're setting the hook and it's game on and there's a fish on so it's it's a super addicting the best way i can describe it it's like a real life fishing video game and that's why i think i've got hooked on this it's so fun to be able to look at these fish see what's happening see them bite your jig on this kind of weird uh, you know, a cryptic way of looking at the water column on the circular flasher and the feeling of knowing what you're doing and when things work out the way they should and you, you see that fish come up, you feel that fish bite and you set the hook is so much fun. So that is like quick 30,000 foot ice fishing 101 from what I've learned over the past, you know, four or five weeks of really learning to ice fish from ground zero and from nothing. And uh, I think it's pretty topical right now. Obviously, in the past week, we saw Texas freeze. You saw people out there ice fishing down south in places that there's never been really ice fishing before. So whether you're down south and you have like a once in a lifetime cold spell or whether you're up north and you're in crummy weather like me, find some safe ice and go out there and try out ice fishing. It's a ton of fun. But again, above all else, do it safely. All right, that is our quick kind of rundown on ice fishing. Um, And before we leave you today, obviously we have a deal courtesy of Top Fishing Deals. The deal of the week this week is going to be on something very topical, and it's an ice fishing soft plastic. So if you go over to www.topfishingdeals.com and search fry, F-R-Y, you're going to see a deal for gulp ice fishing fries, and they're just these normal straight tail small soft plastics. They're one inch in size. They come in four different colors. 15 in a pack, again, a very standard ice fishing profile. Again, it doesn't look like much. It looks like a little plasma tail, uh, one-inch grub, kind of with, like, no action on the tail, really. Um, but when you get it in the water, it actually does have action. It looks great. But, you know, when you're looking at it on a picture or in the box or something, you're like, that doesn't look like it would have much action. Um, but it's just a regular straight tail soft plastic for ice fishing. Um, they're normally $4, but they are on sale right now for two ninety nine dollars a pack. 
So $2.99 for a pack of 15. They are an inch. You can cut them down if you really want to, if you want to make them smaller. Um, they have that gulp scent stuff in it. So, you know, they have the little scent and flavor infused in them. Um, a pretty good deal on a solid little ice fishing soft plastic at $2.99. So go check them out, www.topfishingdeals.com. Search Fry, F-R-Y, and save yourself some money on some small ice fishing plastics. All right, that is our show today. Thank you for tuning in and listening. I know it's a little out of the blue from what we normally do. We're normally very open water bass fishing here, but uh, again, just something that I've really found some enjoyment in over the past couple weeks, and I have had people ask before, why don't you do any ice fishing stuff? And it's like, because I didn't feel it was genuine for me to talk about ice fishing if I've never been and I don't know what I'm doing. It would just be me blowing smoke and pretending like I know what I'm talking about. So now, at least I feel like I know enough of what I'm talking about to give you guys some pointers and get you started, but thank you guys for listening. As always, if you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you listen to podcasts. would really appreciate it. The numbers are still insane. Thank you guys so much. The support's unreal. If you guys want to shoot me a message and talk about anything you heard in today's episode um, or just shoot the wind on fishing, I'm always open to talk at Hayes Fishing, H-A-Z-E Fishing on Instagram or at Tackle Talk Podcast on Instagram or Facebook, www.tackletalkpodcast.com. Keep up with us and we will see you next Tuesday for another episode of Tackle Talk. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk Podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2020. Please subscribe to Tackle Talk on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 